Uh, welcome everybody. It is Thursday morning, um, February 3rd, and we are in General Housing Military Affairs. We're picking up testimony on H96, um, which is a proposal um, relating to the creation of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission Development Task Force. Um, and with us today, we have several witnesses, and I'd just like to get right to it. Um, this is uh, I imagine everyone has seen or has had access to the amendment that's been proposed. We are at a process still of taking testimony before we start working on marking up the bill. So what's proposed is just that. It's a draft. It's a proposal. Um, not sure where this journey will go, but we're starting our focused work on it today. Um, and for the next for the next several weeks. So um, with that, I'd just like to turn the microphone over to Carol McGranahan from the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs. Welcome back, Carol. Hey, thank you all. It's good to see you all. Um, thank you also for inviting me to give some feedback on on the draft bill. Um, I apologize <laughs> ahead of time that I don't always read bills the same as others do. And I'm certainly not a lawyer. So um, I would like to say, uh, start by saying that the commission had met in a two day workshop with the International Center for Transitional Justice um, and uh, Representative Stevens and I believe a couple of the other people on this committee had met with uh, the presenter also to discuss the ins and outs of what truth and, and I call it accountability rather than reconciliation, um, what it means and how do we find this out. It's, it's going to be a very complicated and um, I believe a very involved time intensive um, project that we're all going to be working on. So this bill is really the beginning of um, what can make a big difference in app, you know, impact on the people that were, all the marginalized groups that were affected by the eugenics and in the case of the Abenaki from first contact on. So, I guess I have several questions, but also comments about what this draft bill has or has not covered. Um, my own feeling and, and discussing this with the commission and with also the International Center for Justice um, is that each of the groups that were affected are historically different. Um, the traumas, the truths, the experiences, and the length of time that we were affected are all different. And this bill seems to just have one, um, one group that will be overseeing everyone. So that's my first concern is how do we, how do we find the truth for each group? Each group has its own truth. Um, Examples for the Abenaki are that our land was taken with first contact, was stolen. Our family units were broken up when children or adults were removed. We had language suppression, cultural suppression, and forced assimilation. So these are all experiences that I believe um, are kind of... Um, just involving Apenaki. Um, so I guess that's my recommendation is somehow there be a provision for having this umbrella group that's um, developed in, in this bill and then having separate groups for each of the marginalized uh, groups. And that when we were talking with the um, International Center for Transitional Justice, the, the Apenaki, the commission came up with a title for our uh, group, the Truth Gathering and Accountability Council. 
And of course, I'll, I'll answer questions if you have them of me afterward. But um, I also had questions regarding uh, the first paragraph that in the draft that talks about um, both past and present, but later in the bill, it only talks about doing research on present um, or current status of historically disadvantaged. So it's if you don't do the research on the past, then how can you really make amends for the past? Um, I also had a question about the, or a recommendation for the makeup of the commission members, um, where it talks about appointing a member from each of the four tribes in consultation with the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs. I believe that somebody actually from the commission should be appointed as well. Each of the tribes are, the representatives would be representing their own respective group. Whereas the commission has an overall view and it um, keeps in mind that um, everyone is affected in the indigenous community. So we don't advocate for a particular group, which is what the tribe members would be doing. Um, so I guess I have one question of my reading in the bill is that, is the time period that you're looking at only <clears throat> from eugenics on, or would it actually in the case of um, of the Abenaki include from first contact on. So those are my thoughts um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. I think, um, again, um, <laughs> from what I just heard um, and, and I want to just emphasize again, as a as a draft proposal, you know, we are, this is, this is the work that we're, you know, this is the work that we're really entering into now on this bill. So I appreciate your comments. Um, we've been trying to be very sensitive about each individual group's truths and how they're handled. And I certainly appreciate the comments about, you know, not wanting to get caught up, not feeling like you're going to get caught up in and perhaps left behind. And I think this applies to everybody who's going to testify today of just saying that we don't, you know, we're, we want to appreciate the fact that each group has a different truth or a different story uh, or a different history that, um, that would need to be addressed uh, individually here. Um, questions for Carol? All right, we may broaden the conversation after we hear um, from, from the other witnesses. Thank you, Carol. Always good to have you um, as, uh, representing the commission here in, in committee. Great, thank you so much. Um, next up is Susan Aronoff, um, who is a senior planner and policy analyst for the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. Um, Susan, you joined us last year on, testified on the apology, welcome back. Great, thank you. I uh, wish I could see some of you in person sometime soon. Um, for the record, my name is Susan Aronoff and I am the Senior Planner and Policy Analyst for the Vermont Developmental Disabilities Council. I haven't spent that much time with your committee, so I'd like to explain a little bit about the council and why I am an Agency of Human Services employee um, gets to come and talk to the legislature about issues that impact the lives of Vermonters with disabilities and I get to do so free of any interference from and without needing the consent of any um, administration or state official. So that's really a luxury. I am very privileged and um, really grateful that I get to do this. I will say at the start, uh, really the main thrust of my job is usually to bring the voice of people with disabilities directly to you. And I would really encourage this committee as it did last year to open the doors, open the table, open the conversation to the people with disabilities and their family members who were directly and are still directly impacted 
by the policies of the state. Um, I'm an employee. I myself uh, do have a his history of disability, um, but I wasn't. In, I didn't live in Vermont. So anyway, I think you should really hear from Vermonters with disabilities who are directly impacted. That said, I want to go back to a little bit of background about the Disabilities Council, which like all developmental disabilities council, we are a creature of federal law. We're entirely federally funded. In exchange for receiving this federal funding, the state has to sign a set of insurance assurances with what's called the agency, and this is key, on community living. The agency on community living is the, over, the agency, the federal agency that councils um, answer to. The agency on community living was created in the aftermath of the great expose on uh, Willowbrook. And it was created, uh, DD councils were created um, as a federal response to the horrific conditions at Willowbrook um, at a time when, you know, the people say the conscience of the nation was shocked. And for those of you who were uh, too young or don't remember, I would encourage you to really Google Google that. <laughs> there are some amazing films and footage of Willowbrook and they are chilling. And the conditions in Willowbrook uh, that were exposed led to the creation of the entire federal apparatus that today protects and advocates uh, for and on behalf of people with disabilities. I happen to work in the developmental disability area, but there's a protection and advocacy system um, for people with mental illness and our uh, disability Rights Vermont is Vermont's protection and advocacy legal arm. They subcontract some of that work with, uh, with Legal Aid's Disability Law Project. Anyway, we we're all sisters. Agencies were like the three-legged stool. We were all created together to basically accomplish the same goal, which is to make sure that people with um, disabilities in this country um, have a voice, are seen, are protected. And then slowly um, and through the, you know, the years of advocacy and decisions by the uh, United States Supreme Court, um, institution conditions improved and institutions themselves were, were closed. And um, there's a mandate that people, if they wanna live in the community, can live in the community. And um, again, this is just really key because the, the state of play right now for people with disabilities in Vermont, being able to live in the community. I know you guys are at the housing community committee. I encourage you soon to take up the issue of housing for people with disabilities and maybe consider adding people with disabilities to your housing equity bills. Find out what the home ownership rate is for people with disabilities. But for people with disabilities who are eligible to receive services from the state right now, and that is a small subset, small, we know that there are at least 85 people with intellectual and developmental disabilities waiting to find a shared living provider, which if your committee isn't familiar with that, is basically adult foster care. And so these are 85 people who are really at risk of um, nursing home placement or other sort of institutional placement because um, their needs are great enough, they'd be entitled to a shared living provider, but there just aren't any uh, really available right now in Vermont. So anyway, back to me and the council and why we're uh, here today. Councils have to be made up of a majority of people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their family members. There are other seats on councils for uh, state officials like from our Agency of Education and Department of Health. And there always has to be a seat for a service provider. And interestingly, this is the only requirement like this that I'm aware of. Maybe our sister mental health agencies have one, but one of our council members always has to have the lived experience of living in, of in, living in an institution. And it doesn't have to be an institution like Brandon, it could be a nursing home. But anyway, all councils in all 50 states and territories are always supposed to be informed by that lived experience. So councils like ours exist today to bring the voice of people with disabilities to the heart of their communities in Vermont. Um, the federal law talks about where Vermonters live, work, learn, and play, and typically where the policies that impact their lives are made. So you, the legislature, you make the most policies that impact people's lives. 
and half the time it's my job to educate legislators about um, the programs and services that exist now and what could be better. And then half the time it's my job to educate the people with disabilities about, hey, what are the folks at the legislature doing now that might be impacting me. And so it was you, the legislators, who this specific committee led by your chair who took on apologizing um, for the eugenics policies. And um, it was legislators who, before you who created them. And, you know, I'm going to use the language. We, we don't use this language in our meetings. If I did, I would have to give a trigger warning. And, you know, when, the, when we met with the House leadership before the summer apology event, we said, hey, if you read the apology proclamation the way it is, you might want to give a trigger warning because it uses language we do not use. We don't, we don't. I'm going here today because I think it's important that you, you hear this language again in case um, it's been forgotten that what, Brand, what Brandon was originally called, that when people were told to give their children up and leave them at Brandon and forget about them. And that's the testimony that you heard from some of our council members. And when you heard from Susan Ashcroft, who lived at Brandon um, last year, those of you who are here, um, this was what Brandon was called. It was the Vermont State School for Feeble-Minded Children. And Waterbury, I think you heard from people who lived at Waterbury. I cut my teeth as an attorney in Waterbury. It was a chilling place. And that was called the Vermont State Asylum for the Insane. So that's what legislators before you created. And that's what you guys reached down deep to apologize for. And before issuing that apology, you listen to the stories of the people I just mentioned, um, Susan Ashcroft, Kay Stambler, other people. And um, you also listened, I think, to some of their hopes and dreams for a better Vermont. And um, I just want to say a little bit about what happened when you guys took up the eugenics apology. I know I've said this before, but I can't really explain enough. Uh, because you guys took up the eugenics policy, I had to explain eugenics to people who had never heard the word, didn't know what the word meant, but who most assuredly would have been targeted to be removed from the gene pool. And so I would say eugenics. It comes from you, meaning good, like euphoria, and genics, meaning genes. Like literally, eugenics means good genes. And then there'd be the silence as people realized I was talking about them or their children or their sister. Our council members aren't just parents. We have a council member who's the sister of someone with Down syndrome. Um, and my council members and I, literally, we were as shocked as you and other members of the General Assembly when we learned about, and we had to learn about, Vermont's role in developing and spreading eugenics. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't know. Um, so people with, dis with disabilities aren't born knowing any more about disabilities than anyone else does, or the history. So anyway, last year, the council's platform included um, the apology, and this year, our council's platform includes what are the next steps? Because when people came in to testify for the apology, the committee said, and the apology itself says, there are gonna be next steps. This summer at the event, um, in the well of the house, I had an opportunity to talk to the chair and he relayed this question to me to bring back to the um, disability community at large. What would truth be? What would reconciliation mean? And so a committee is formed and discussions have begun between, you know, the Vermont, just so you don't, in case you're not aware, there's an umbrella organization called the Vermont Coalition for Disability Rights, which is made up of a lot of member organizations from lots of different types of disabilities, like the Vermont Association for the Blind and Visually Impaired, and Green Mountain Self Advocates. And anyway, we have an umbrella organization that has a policy committee that's out talking about this very thing. What would truth mean? What would reconciliation mean? And the main thing that people are coming up with is, geez, Brandon closed 25 years ago, and the promises of Vermont made then just have not been kept. As I said at the beginning, there are at least 85 people waiting 
85 of a small group of people mm -hmm. get uh, Medicaid funded home and community based services. Um, mm -hmm. They are waiting for a simple place to live. Um, even if they had the places to live, we don't have a workforce right now to support people in the community. So our entire workforce, the home and community-based workforce needs a living wage and those wages, wages need to go up annually, just like the wages for hospital workers do and insurance rates and everyone else in the continuum of care. The main thing that's come across to me is people want inclusion, inclusion in their communities. Um, that was the big, uh, the big thing about eugenics was it was a huge force of exclusion, taking people out of their community, communities, out of their schools, out of homes, separating people. So people want inclusion. And um, interestingly enough, there's, there are people uh, who want protection for parents with disabilities and people who want protection, who want positive sexuality education for uh, students with disabilities. The theme of this year's Disability Awareness Day is built on this. It's kind of inclusion everywhere. And the theme is open to change, open to all. And so I would encourage you as a committee, when you <clears throat> look at H96, to take that message to heart. Be open to change and to be open to all and to hear uh, from other people and to consider practicing inclusion, um, not exclusion. Because um, the real takeaway in my message today is from the people who are impacted by eugenics, when I explained to them that age 96 does not include um, people with disabilities, even though people with disabilities were very specifically included in eugenics and in the um, apology, they're very confused. And so I try to say, well, maybe this isn't the eugenics next steps. Maybe the committee's thinking of other steps for eugenics. So if so, it'd be great to hear. But if this is the next steps for eugenics, then I would say, take that message to be open to change and open to all, all at least who are in the apology. I got a message from one legislator that, if you make, that this might be intentional. And if you make the tent too big and include people with disabilities, uh, the tent will collapse. So anyway, I was very saddened <laughs> to hear that message from a legislator who I won't name, but who I respect greatly. And I just hope that this committee isn't thinking about um, excluding the disability community from your next steps. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. We have a question from Representative Hango and then Triana. It's not really a question, but thank you. I just wanted to make a statement that I too was very confused when I read this bill because I was not part of putting this bill together. And um, to me, it doesn't even really, um, it does not entirely relate back to the eugenics apology that we worked so hard on. And I'm, I'm very confused at the conspicuous absence of some of the groups that we fought very hard to have included in the apology. So thank you for putting that all so eloquently and I'm sure we'll have a lot of discussion about it. Representative Triana, thank you. <clears throat> Stevens, uh, yeah, sort of a follow-up. I, you know, my thoughts, um, Susan, good to see you again. It's been a long time. Um, and uh, is, is that we not forget the, disability, the disabled population that were impacted by eugenics. Um, it really came clear in some of the reading and research that we did for the apology. Um, and I think it's a very important thing to, to remember. And just a couple of comments. Uh, I lived on Staten Island when Willowbrook was closed and I was part of the opposition because it was just a total snake pit. Um, and I spent some time at uh, the uh, State Hospital in Waterbury visiting uh, clients there. And I can testify that that was not a very pleasant place to be either. So I can very much relate to the two instances that you uh, bring up uh, in your report. Thanks, Susan. Further questions for Susan at this time? Thank you, Susan. Um, Next up, we have Dr. the Reverend Dr. Arnold Thomas. Um, 
who is the pastor at Good Shepherd Lutheran Church. Welcome back, Arnold. Thank you for, for having me. It's so good to be back. This committee is starting to look like an extended family. I've been uh, <laughs> my presence among you, but it, uh, it's we have good a good handful here. of bills. If you'd like to testify on the, I, I, <laughs> <laughs> I remember. I keep reminding myself that I am a pastor of the church, and so I I know where my bread is buttered. But I appreciate the invitation. <laughs> there are several thoughts I have in mind as. I offer my support of this bill, of this bill, page 96. First, and it has been alluded to in, in the previous speakers, first is the thought that the work of this task force must ultimately merge with other groups that are seeking reparations for the harms and the oppressions done, uh, both within Vermont as well as in the nation. For instance, as H387 addresses reparations for the institution and ongoing legacy of slavery against African Americans, the Truth and Reconciliation Task Force must inevitably incorporate the objectives of H387 and other oppressed groups that are in need of reparations into its objective. Truth and Reconciliation suggests a process of awakening and enlightening others about the repulsive and lingering realities of systemic racism and other forms of oppression toward BIPOC Vermonters that most Vermonters continue to either deny or of which they are unaware. If the purpose of this task force is to, and I quote, develop and submit to the General Assembly a proposal for legislation to create one or more truth and reconciliation commissions to examine and begin the process of dismantling institutional, structural, and systemic discrimination in Vermont, both past and present, it already sounds like an intentionally crafted, slow-moving process of bureaucratic red taping that is bound to frustrate all involved. However, the element of this proposal that sustains my interest is the portion of the purpose statement that says, examine and begin the process of dismantling institutional, structural, and systemic discrimination in Vermont, both past and present which means for me that this task force will not simply seek an apology for wrongs committed to BIPOC and other marginalized Vermonters, nor will it seek proactive inclusion into the present day power structures of the state. If we are concerned about dismantling institutional, structural and systemic discrimination in Vermont, then the task force must address the critical examination and possible overhauling of an entire constitutional structure created to empower, preserve the economic, social, political, and moral status of white men over everyone else. In other words, we're not just asking for an equitable portion of the American pie. We're saying that the recipe is poison and needs to be cre recreated to satisfy the palates of all invited to the banquet. If this is the intent of the task force, I'm all in. If not, then I would dare say you're wasting my time and that of every person of color and marginalized individual in this room. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, um, Arnold. 
We are, um, Chip, is that a legacy hand? Yes, sorry. Um, so Carol and Susan and Arnold, thank you for your, your comments on this. I think um, we, as we've been moving forward since the, for several years now, since we're starting work on picking up work, really not starting up, but picking up work on the apology and understanding in the context of, um, you know, really, obviously contemporary events have shaped a, a, a renewal of how we view the past and what we have not to speak to Arnold's comments to, 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 you know, we as members of the system. And I, and I always want to make sure that we all acknowledge that as legislators, no matter how much citizen legislators we are, um, we are part of the system that has created, uh, this, the circumstance. Um, and so we take your words to heart. Um, if we left, when we left people or names or situations out, it's not by commission. And we will address this, the specific groups and the specific to the depth that you're advising us to as we, as we move forward. And um, we do not have experience in this. And there's experience that we can pull on that will be available to us um, next week in particular, we'll be having a training with a group that uh, the Vermont Commission has already worked with, um, on Native American Affairs has already worked with, to try to give us an understanding of what we talk about when we talk about truth and reconciliation. What do we talk, what are we talking about when we're talking about reparations? What are we talking about when we're talking about systemic, uh, dismantling systemic racism? What are we talking about when we address any of these needs and how can we make them worthwhile? Because to your point, Arnold, you're right. If this isn't true and deep, then, then, um, then what are we doing? Um, Susan? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One thing I didn't address, but I did just want to say, because it, we have discussed it, um, preliminary discussions, in what I will just call the disability community um, is the issue of reparations and restitution. I think this committee is probably aware that in other states, um, people who were uh, sterilized or family members of people who were sterilized have been receiving um, cash payments from states um, in response to eugenics policies. That's not something that's come up in any, any of the groups that I've been in. However, what I wanted to say is that for any sort of truth and reconciliation process going forward, I wouldn't suggest taking off the table and I'd be very interested in hearing how other states went about identifying um, who those people are uh, today. You know, brand and clothes 25 years ago, there might be people, some of you are probably aware, maybe you're not, that uh, often as a condition of leaving Brandon, um, people had to quote unquote agree um, to be sterilized. So Brandon closed 25 years ago. It very may be, very well may be that there are people in Vermont alive and well today um, who were in fact sterilized um, at Brandon or any of the other places that perform sterilizations. And I would not presume at all ever <laughs> to speak on their or their family members behalf and take restitution or reparations for them uh, as have been made in other states uh, anywhere near off the table. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. I am aware and we'll try to get testimony <laughs> from individuals in California just had a recent settlement where this was this um, where this happened. Um, so I wanna I wanna introduce and invite Matt Dunlap to the table now. Um, I have only met Matt last fall, late last fall via phone. Um, Matt can introduce himself and how he fits into this picture, but it's the short story is that Maine with their, um, 
with their federally recognized tribes had a Truth and Reconciliation Commission um, a few years, well, the most recent one was a few years ago, um, which dealt with the use of, of, of funds for education. And Matt served as a co-chair on that commission. And I wanted to invite him in because Matt was a part of Maine's system, um, you know, being involved in the legislature and in the government. And I just wanted to get um, has have him share his thoughts just about not only the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, but the notion of reparations. Because uh, Arnold, to your question earlier, I mean, again, nothing is nothing is finished, nothing is done, but I certainly hear the, the worry that if we put one one thing into motion, a Truth and Reconciliation Commission, that the rest works on a linear matter. That that so-called reparations has to wait for something else to finish, and I don't think. I don't think personally. I won't speak for the committee and the work that gets done by any potential committee. But the goal is to not make it linear, because there are things that can be put into place, you know, otherwise. And I think I'll just turn it over to Matt to try to share his experiences in Maine with us. Um, I hope plus and minus. Uh, you know some of the roads that you had to that you had to travel to get to where you got to. So welcome, Matt. Before you start, we're going to introduce ourselves. Um, I'm I'm sorry, we, I didn't do this at the beginning, but if we can start, there's two of us on Zoom. Mary. Good morning. I am Mary Howard. I represent Rutland South District Five Three. Thank you. You're muted. Chip. I missed, I missed the microphone, sorry. Uh, <laughs> so good morning, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Chip Troiello. I'm representative representing Hardwick, Standard, and Walden in the Northeast Kingdom of Vermont. And I missed that we have a third member online, um, Representative Barra. He may not be. Um, anyway, Matt, Representative Byron is online as well. Representative Hanko. Good morning. I'm Representative Lisa Hango, Franklin 5. I represent Richford, Berkshire, Franklin, and Highgate on the northern border of Vermont. I'm Seth Blumley, and I represent Burlington South End. John Kalaki from South Burlington. Joe Parsons, I represent the towns of Groton, Thompson, and Newburgh. John Polasek, and I represent Milton. Tommy Walsh, I represent Barry City, born in Bangor and grew up in VZ. <laughs> <laughs> Barbara Murphy, I serve Fairfax in the District of Franklin, too. And Tom Stevens, I live in Waterbury and represent Waterbury, Huntington, uh, Bolton, and Buell's Gore. Welcome. Well, if you're ready for me. I am. Thank you, Representative Stevens and distinguished members of the General Housing and Military Affairs Committee. Uh, my name is Matt Dunlap, and I live in Old Town, Maine. Um, a little bit about myself. Um, I'm not too far from VZ. <laughs> and in fact, the old VZ Railway used to run right through Old Town. It was the second railway in the United States. So um, we have a, a very strong affinity for Vermont. Uh, our family goes out there every year, usually around Stowe and Burlington. So um, I seldom ask you all directly for permission uh, to come and contribute to your economy. I do try to get some, um, some uh, leave to come and visit from my good friend, Jim Condos, um, and prior to him also, Deb Markowitz. I was Secretary of State in Maine for 14 years. Um, and I was state auditor for a year, and I was in the legislature for eight years representing the old 121st House District, which included part of Old Town and the Penobscot Nation. So um, I had the opportunity to meet with uh, a concentrated group of legislators talking about this process in Vermont, and had a follow-up conversation with Representative Stevens about our experience. One of the things I am going to do for you, um, I just entered into the chat, uh, a link to the report of our commission, which since this is a public meeting, this will be part of the public record. Um, it's, you know, let me just get right to the discussion here. Now, it may shock the, the members of the committee to learn that this is a, 
a very emotional and draining process that you're about to engage in. Um, this is something that, you know, we were the first state, actually the first commission of its kind in the world to be created with the consent of all the parties involved. Now that sounds a little bit odd. We spent a lot of time studying what commissions of this kind do. And there've been a lot of truth commissions. So I mean, it was a process I had never really heard very much about. You don't really hear much about truth commissions when you chair the Joint Standing Committee on Inland Fisheries and Wildlife for six years. Um, the, the process itself has been employed in the recent decades to try to bring some closure, if you will, to periods of great upheaval. And typically there's an event, right? There's, a, there's an insurrection or a rebellion um, and there are atrocities committed. And when the, when the smoke clears, um, one side typically will establish the victorious side, if you will, will establish a truth commission to get to the bottom of the crimes of those who have been defeated in said revolution. So um, the, the, in that regard, they're sometimes used as justification for putting people in prison, that type of thing. Um, we were looking at it in an entirely different way. Maine has four federally recognized tribes. At one time, we had as many as 30 native nations endemic to Maine, many of whom merged with others or fled to Canada or just simply evaporated. Um, and like Vermont, I'm sure if you delve into the origin of many of your place names, many of those places are not just rivers or counties. Um, they are actually names of, of now disappeared tribal communities, including the Androscoggin, the Chisuncook, the Saco, uh, the Kennebec, uh, those are tribes that no longer ex exist officially in Maine. So our tribes are the Penobscot, Passamaquoddy, Maliseet, and Micmac. Some of the Micmacs and Maliseets have strong presences mostly in Canada, but they also spill over into Maine. So um, there, the process that we went through um, was really almost accidental. You know, the Indian Child Welfare Act was passed in 1978. Maine lagged in compliance, and there is an effort to try to improve compliance with the Indian Child Welfare Act, which basically says that in a stressed tribal family, if children have to be removed and placed somewhere else, they should be placed with another tribal family and not a non-tribal uh, community, something that Maine paid no attention to, really. And the, the timeline was about 21 years before Maine really took a look at this. And there was an effort to try to train its, its uh, health and human services caseworkers on, in this field. And a training video was created interviewing members of the tribes who had been taken away from their families. And it was a terribly traumatizing event. Um, and that got people to thinking. And over the course of about 10 years, this process came to the fore, the idea of developing a truth commission uh, to look at what had happened in the child welfare system in Maine uh, from 1978 forward. Now, the mandate was rather loose, which is good because we took testimony from many, many people who fell outside of those parameters. And that's important as you're building a, a truth commission or giving it a mandate, uh, give them the flexibility they need to do their work. The issue of reparations came up very soon. Um, it was something actually I was named to the commission in the fall. Uh, there was a whole process and mm -hmm. it was not created by the legislature. It was created by a convening group of about 25 people which had representatives from the state as part of it. Um, many tribal folks, uh, people from outside both uh, circles and then they came up with a, an agreement, an intent to do this. It was signed by the tribal chiefs and the governor um, officially in the state house. I believe if I can go back and look at that really quickly, that would have been in uh, 2000. Uh, they wrote the mandate was written in 2010. And then in 2012, the, in June of 2012, they had a, a signing ceremony between the governor and the four tribal governors. Um, that started a, a fairly lengthy process of selecting commissioners. There are five commissioners selected. I was one of them. And um, we had 25 months to do, go through this process. We had to develop, we had to hire staff, we had to raise money. Um, 
and we went into the tribal communities and our job effectively was to bear witness to what people had been through. And we learned a lot about the industrial schools, the residential schools, if you will, which have now come back into the news because of uh, the mass graves found at some of them. But let me get back to the reparation thing. I keep drifting away from that and I apologize, Mr. Chairman. But um, after I was named, I, I had just been reelected after a two year absence to secretary of state again. Um, I had done some work in the private sector between my two stents. And then one day I got a call from our governor. <clears throat> and the governor was, excuse me, quite concerned about my presence on the commission and said explicitly that if I was on the commission that he could not support the work of the commission. And that was because he, you know, he said to me, you have a fiduciary responsibility to the people of the state of Maine and someone could take a report of this commission and then warp it somehow to leverage financial reparations. Well, as it happened, I knew a thing or two about reparations because I had been speaker pro tem in the main house. Um, we had our own series of scandals. It's, you know, I know Maine doesn't seem like a scandal place. Uh, we, do, we do have our scandals from time to time. This one was a bad one and it went on for many, many years. We had a school for the deaf uh, located just outside of Portland, Maine. Um, and the, the abuses that were wrought there were truly horrific, um, true atrocities rendered on helpless children. And uh, the state basically turned a blind eye. And when it all came out years later, uh, work was done by the legislature to try to atone for those sins. And as a result, um, you know, uh, they came up with a, a pool of money to, to uh, compensate people for their for their for what they'd suffered now what i said to the governor is that you know you go look back on the baxter school for the deaf compensation fund there was no commission that recommended that the legislature just did it so in terms of policy you know the the legislature has the power to act on what reverend thomas and and uh ms aronoff have talked about uh which is to you know to Try to make people whole. You don't need a commission to do that. And I mentioned this to Representative Stevens in our conversation. Uh, what the commission does is not justify, you know, it, trying to find a way to make things right financially for people. That's a separate track. That's a separate process. What we were interested in is finding a vector for people to find healing. You know, this is something that's really, really important. You know, for those folks who were traumatized by telling their stories about what had happened to them in the child welfare system, you have to remember that they didn't realize they had stories. This is just what they had experienced. It was their lives. It was, they didn't see it as a one-off or an exception. And part of what we did in, in hearing and bearing witness to what they had to say was to assure them that no, they, they were not out of their minds. This was not normal. It was, it was criminal what had happened to them. You know, and you hear what people did to children. You know, one of our witnesses talked about when they were taken by the state. Uh, this is done by the state, mind you. And then the churches had some involvement as well, historically. I mean, she was playing in her yard with her sister and all of a sudden a station wagon pulls up and these people come out and they go into the house. Her mother was out picking berries in the back field and they grab trash bags and they put their clothes in the trash bags and they hustle them into the car. And what she talked about as they drove and they drove and they drove, she's looking out the window trying to remember landmarks and she thought in fear and panic that I'm not gonna remember my way home. You know, and that's just one part of that horrible story. So we bear witness to these things. We have an archive, um, a video archive of the testimony that was taken, not only from tribal members, mind you, but also people that were caseworkers at the time, judges who presided over some of these cases. Uh, we issued a report, uh, which is now uh, on your committee website. Um, and the work continues. And it didn't follow any predictable path, by the way. Um, you know, we would make very complicated arrangements to go visit some of these communities up in Madoknakuk or in Zabayak. 
or an Indian township or outside of Caribou. We drive for many, many hours. We'd have hotels. We'd stay there for several days. We'd get into a, a community center and not a single person would show. And we would wait, you know, and, and then we'd leave. And of course the, the convening group now called Wabanaki Reach, um, you know, they had set up a mechanism. This was a question that came up you know, did you have someone standing by to sort of provide support to people? And yes, we did. And, um, but they would report back to us that after we left, people would sort of gather and they'd have these talking circles and kind of like go over what they'd been through. And that still continues. So in no small way, we were incredibly successful. Now, there is also uh, another resource, which I had mentioned to the chair and to the group I spoke with earlier in December. And this happened rather early on. So here we are, you know, <laughs> this has never happened before and um, we're trying to figure it out. So we, one of the folks from the convening group says, hey, we have this great opportunity. And they're like, okay, what's the opportunity? Well, there's a, a documentary film crew that like to follow you around. And I think all five of us, you know, all of our eyes rolled into the back of our heads. And I think there may have been flecks of foam at the corner of our mouths. I was like, this is going to be hard enough to do this. You know, having somebody hovering over you, the camera is just, that's kind of a non-starter. Um, the, but the Upstander project did follow us around for two years. Uh, they shot thousands of hours of film and that was, um, that was gelled into a documentary film. The original documentary is about 90 minutes long. They uh, edited it down to an hour. It was called Don Land. And you can find the trailer and maybe some of the, uh, the film, aspects of the film on YouTube, Don Land. Uh, it was shown on Independent Lens and Public Broadcasting and won an Emmy Award. I tell my friends who are about to see it for the first time that they will be amazed that I did all my own stunts in the film. Um, it's a, but it, it turned out to be one of the most important things that came out of that process. It's been seen millions of times and um, has sort of served as a bit of a blueprint, if you will. Uh, we have learned not only the, of the TRC process as being contemplated in Vermont, but one of our commissioners, uh, Sandy Whitehawk, as a Lakota Sioux from the Rosebud Reservation in South Dakota and lives in Minnesota. Apparently now Minnesota is engaging in the truth and reconciliation process along the same lines. So, um, you know, we did study a lot of truth commissions and uh, they all had different goals. Some of them do not succeed. You know, they, they never get to the point where they write a report. So how you craft this thing is really, really important. And um, it could very well be that the work of this committee uh, is just the very, very beginning of this process as you establish and authorize a commission and then try to figure out how it's going to be constructed and what its aims are going to be. Um, you know, the reparation component, which I know is on everybody's minds, sort of follows its own track organically and is not necessarily critical to the work of the, of the commission. Understanding, I think, you know, and I'm going to stop after this point because I can go on for a long time about this. We understood early on that the most important audience the most difficult audience that we had to talk to was not the tribal communities. It was our own community, the post-colonial white community. Um, one of our key findings in our report was that much of what had happened to children, tribal children in our child welfare system, which was supposed to protect them, was a result of two major components, institutional racism, and cultural genocide that had a strong reaction from many corners and you know you talk to people on the street and they're like genocide yeah i have nothing to do with that and you know that's it's very difficult for people to take ownership of their own culture and say you know with, with any type of emphasis that you know where i'm sitting right here in old town maine you know, it's a, it's a lovely community. I can, I was digging into the yard to plant a flower garden and I got into the clay, which is part of the ancient riverbed of the Penobscot River from the glacial melt. And, you know, the Penobscots have lived here for probably 12,000 years. 
I get to live on this little piece of land because someone who came in here long before me made sure that it was taken away from the Penobscots so that you know, my community could thrive here. Um, and you have to have some ownership of that and responsibility for it. And if you can take responsibility for it, this is the thing I said over and over and over again as Secretary of State, that I could not divorce myself from the actions of any of my predecessors, including colonial predecessors. But if you own it, then you can change it. You can stop it and you know, maybe make that long transition from occupier, as my friend Gisa Tanamuk, who was another commissioner, said, to neighbor. And that's an that's a important but difficult journey. And at that, with that, I'll, I'll stop, Mr. Chairman. And at the pleasure of the chair, I'll entertain any questions of the committee at this time or later, if it should come to pass. Thank you, Matt. Um, can you spend a little bit of time on the process prior to the, the formation of the commission? I mean, we may do things differently in Maine. I don't know if you do it by resolution or if it has to go through statute like what we have to do, but can you just talk a little bit about the place where we are right now to the point of having a commission to, to start in? Yeah, well, you're light years ahead of where we were and still are in many ways. You know, the legislature has never really taken control of this at all in Maine. Um, there is pending legislation right now. See, Maine's situation is somewhat different from Vermont's in that because we have four federally recognized tribes. Going back 50 years ago, there was some serious federal lit litigation involved that the state of Maine had, was in serious breach of a number of the treaties that had been either signed by the state or inherited from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, of which Maine was a part until 1820. And that because of those treaty violations, uh, vast tracts of land that were held by either private interests or by the state itself were subject to forfeiture to the native communities. That litigation was resolved by a federal act that was signed by President Carter in 1980 called the Indian Land Claim Settlement Act, um, which was really rushed through. And I think it was rushed through historically because there was fear that if um, you know, President Reagan, after he took the oath of office, that he would not have any inclination to sign such a bill. So uh, people wanted to get this put to bed. Now, Unfortunately, there was a disconnect in how people perceived that federal law. The tribal folks believed that we were beginning a conversation. Um, state folks believed that the conversation was now ended. It was, it was resolved, you know, it had been settled. And a big chunk of what came out of that was that the tribes basically abandoned much of their sovereign interests um, in exchange for a large cash settlement from the federal government. So there's well over 500 recognized tribes in the United States. All of them have um, distinct levels of sovereignty and self-governance except for the tribes in Maine. And so now there is legislation to try to restore many aspects of tribal sovereignty. Um, it's very difficult to move. This is a very complicated bill and um, it's scheduled for a second hearing uh, later this month. Um, the chairs of the committee are very skeptical uh, of its chances because the governor has issues with it. So it's a really, it's really a very difficult taffy pull. But to your, to your point, Vermont's way ahead of us. You know, the legislature is actively involved and the legislature in Maine continues to grapple with this. And in my conversations with Maine legislators, they say that, that you know, I'm, I'm also, currently the chair of the Episcopal Diocesan Committee on Indian Relations in the state of Maine. Uh, the, the bishop there asked me to be a part of that and I am chair of it. Um, and the chair, as I said, is really the work of groups like the Committee on Indian Relations and the Episcopal Diocese and the Quaker Friends Committee, which is very active in these affairs. That's really gonna move the needle more so than the legislature itself. Because with all due respect to the legislature, being a former member of a legislature, I know that the longest four letter word in, legis in the legislative language is in fact change. You know, everybody hates change, you know, because it's uh, unpredictable and you don't know what path it's going to take and where it's going to lead you. So 
um, in that regard, um, you know, what we did in Maine, and I can send you another link, uh, which I will send you another link, and this is actually a very useful Wikipedia link, um, which tells you a little bit about um, what that timeline looked like, which is not in the report I also posted. So uh, I'm sure uh, Ron can put that on the committee page as well. So that tells you a little bit about the timeline that we went through and who the commissioners were and that sort of thing and how the process went forward. But it was sort of, or like I say, it was organic, it was independent. Um, it, was the, it was the convening group, which you know, came about uh, just, like I say, organically. It was not a legislative thing at all. Um, and while we had had legislation in front of the Judiciary Committee in the legislature, um, not a lot has, has moved. I mean, these are very, very difficult issues to get your hands around. Tell me a little bit about this independence, uh, about how it raised up um, organically, because there's, there's one of the issues that I, that I constantly come back to is that as a legislator, as a member of this system, it's very, it's, it, we can't be the judge, the jury, and the defendant yeah. in, if we stretch that out to a truth and reconciliation commission. So where did, where was this independently housed? I mean, we, we've heard, you know, we don't have a ton of resources, but was this, was this housed in, you know, a school of law? Was this housed through the university? Was this, in, was this raised, was the money raised totally independently from Mainers who were just interested in seeing this form of conversation? Um, it was, it wasn't really housed anywhere. You know, that was one of the strange things about it compared to what, you know, I've been on a lot of task force and commissions over the years. Um, it was authorized by the five governments, you know, the, the Penobscot, the Passamaquoddy, Micmac Maliseet, and the state, the you know, they signed a mandate that we were going to do this together. So, you know, the, the funding is actually a really important story because originally we had had a promise of a substantial grant grant from a national foundation uh, that was going to pay for the whole thing like two million dollars um, and that fell through at the very last minute luckily um, our co-chair carol wishcamper had had a long history in institutional fundraising and in fact all of us had some history in fundraising including myself most of my fundraising is accidental or political um, so we knew how to raise money, um, and that's how we funded the commission was through grants from, you know, foundations and other nonprofits, and we were able to kind of do it on the cheap, if you will. I mean, we had to rent an office, we had uh, a researcher, we had an executive director, we had an administrative assistant, and that was really, for the most part, about it. We had some other folks, but they were not paid. And then we had, you know, money to rent hotel rooms. Maine's a big state, it's bigger than the rest of New England combined, you know, not to brag or anything, but, um, you know, that's, you know, it really, um, you go up to far northern Maine, like around, you know, Madawaska, Fort Kent, from the state capital in Augusta, it takes less time to drive to New York City than it does to drive to uh, Fort Kent. So, you know, we obviously needed to have hotel accommodations when we went into some of the communities. So we had money to pay for that type of thing. Um, but also too, we were all willing to kind of take care of ourselves, you know, so we didn't ask to be reimbursed for mileage, if, you know, for example, that type of thing. So, you know, um, in that regard, we were able to be self-sufficient and self-sustaining. Um, and the more independent you can make it, I don't know how the Vermont statutes work, but in Maine, uh, we have a mechanism of the authority, if you will. Uh, the authority is a quasi-independent organization that does not uh, answer to the executive um, or to the legislature. It exists on its own and as a separate construct, like our turnpike authority. We had used to have a, an Atlantic salmon authority. Um, so they, that gives them a, a, a patina of independence, you know, but you know, whatever mechanism you have, the more independent you can make it, the better off you are for the very reasons that you cite. Um, you may want to create a mechanism that simply, you know, develops 
the commission, you know, comes up with criteria, uh, an interview committee, you know, um, when Maine's commission was formed, you know, there was like almost 500 people that were interested in being a part of it. There's a woman that I went to church with that asked if she could nominate me. I guess I look like a light touch, I suppose. <laughs> And I said, well, hold on, you know, I, because I represented the Penobscots, I've seen a lot of um, great ideas come out of Augusta designed to save the native peoples. And, you know, and sometimes they sort of take a step back and scratch their head. It's like, what is this all about? So I talked to some of the folks that I trusted in the Penobscot Nation. And they said, this is one, arguably one of the most important things we've ever done. And so I said, sure, go ahead, nominate me. I have no background in child welfare. They'll never pick me. Um, it was so extraordinary that when I went for my interview, I couldn't believe I was invited for an interview. I said to the, to the interview committee, I said, it must be very lonely at the bottom of the barrel if you're talking to me. Um, all of us who were selected said the same thing when we first got together, that we never thought we'd be picked. Um, but they did a really good job. We worked really, really well together. We had two Native people on the commission neither were Wabanaki. They were not from Maine. Gisa Tanamuk was a uh, Mashpee Wampanoag from Cape Cod, um, lived in New Brunswick, and Sandy Whitehawk, as I mentioned, was a Lakota Sioux from, um, originally from South Dakota. The others, you know, Gail Werbach was chair of the, of the social work department at the University of Maine. Carol Wishcamper had been on the State Board of Education, and I was Secretary of State. So, um, you know, a very diverse group. Uh, one of the dangers that you will, that we were told about, about having a, tri a tribal member on the commission is, or even all the tribes represented is that they would compete with each other for attention. You know, that was the fear that they, oh, they that the Mi'kmaq representative would be focused on the Mi'kmaq issue and the Penobscot representative would be focused on the Penobscot issue and that get every, all the tribal members out of there. That was controversial. In fact, I had a malice seat tribal representative in the legislature come up to me and say I should resign so he could take my place. Um, there was no mechanism to replace us. If one of us passed away, which thankfully nobody did, we just continue on with four commissioners instead of five. So, um, you know, I don't know a lot of it was by, if how much of it was by design, Mr. Chairman, but it seemed to work pretty well. Um, the independence component of it, you know, um, you know, we have the report out there. Like I said earlier, I think the most important aspect of it was the documentary, which I invite, I send a link, I believe, to um, to the chair and some other folks who are interested in this uh, from the Upstander group. Um, it's got, it's, it's not something you just download. It's right now, they're still, you know, proprietors of it. Um, they show it for free. Um, and it's, it's, um, it's out there. So I can help facilitate that if the committee's interested. Representative Hango. Thank you very much for being here. I am kind of blown away uh, to use that term lightly. No, I just can't believe how different the organization you have in the state of Maine is from what we have here in Vermont. And I do find it extremely refreshing to know that it was um, an independent commission um, that worked on this and they were not, you were not folks who were politically connected at that time. Um, so this is all very fascinating to me and I really appreciate the chair bringing you in. Thank you. Well, and I, I have told the chair and others, you know, I'm happy uh, to be at your disposal. I mean, I can talk with you individually if you want to get some more, some more detail. Um, again, this is a long story, and I've tried to keep it kind of short, um, just to be courteous to you as the committee and the public. Um, but it's a, it, it is a different construct than what I was used to being a part of. Um, you know, an example to look at is look at the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which is sort of fashioned in a similar way to what you're describing, which was a government mandate. Uh, the government funded it with hundreds of millions of dollars. Um, and it's, it's, I think it's actually still going on. It's a, this is a really, really hard process. Um, and I don't think there's any formula that 
works better than another. It really depends on what you want it to do and what you think will work for the people of Vermont and the members of the Abenaki people who were endemic to that area, um, which is really what you want to focus on. So uh, really it's up to you how you want to proceed. Thank you. Representative Bloomley Van Klacki. Yes, hi, <clears throat> oh, Matt. Thanks so much for this presentation. It's very, very helpful. I am curious about what the, <clears throat> the government's role was. Um, you say it was, you know, um, as independent as it could be, but was there legislative action or was there executive action um, that, you know, empowered this process to begin? Um, and can you tell us a little bit more about who was choosing um, those who would serve on uh, the commission? Sure. Um, so the 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 group that was put together to interview potential commissioners really emerged out of what became known as the convening group and now Wabanaki Reach. They, you know, and state government was represented there. There were representatives of the governor's office and the attorney general's office that were a part of it. You had folks from the Department of Human Services. You had folks from the tribal communities. Um, I could probably get a comprehensive list if you're interested in who those people were, maybe talk to them, you know, um, about what they were thinking as they put together the commission. Uh, it was totally independent, you know, to the point where when Governor LePage said, I want you off this commission, I talked to the other commissioners. I said, if you think this is going to cripple our work, I'll resign. And they're like, no, we want you to stay. So we were like, okay, Governor, see ya. <laughs> you know, the ship sailed. There's nothing you can do about it. Um, you know, and, and that's one of the things I think when you think about independence, you know, you deal with this every day as legislators, the, the, the independence of the House versus the Senate from the executive, from the courts, uh, even as individual members, you know, the authority of the chair comes from the committee. If the chair makes a ruling and members of the committee disagree with it, they can move to overrule the ruling of the chair. So uh, independence is really sort of the watchword of what we do in government. So it wasn't completely alien and unfamiliar. Um, in terms of what the legislature itself, most of them were completely unaware of what we were doing. Um, and um, there was legislation that was filed to put some of what we talked about into statute, some of that happened on a minor key, but how do you put cultural genocide in the law, right? You know, it's, it's very difficult. Uh, I think the simple recognition, and this is, again, a really important thing about the outcome. Let's cut to the chase. So we finished our report, and now we're about to issue it. Well, what do you do? You know, the, the first thing we did was we went to every individual tribal community and let them see it first before we made it public. The reaction was really stunning. You know, it wasn't, you know, nobody, you know, pumped their fist in the air. You could see their shoulders kind of drop with relief. You know, it's like, oh, you know, it, it, what we see is true. You know, this is, you know, we're not just, you know, suffering in silence. Other people see that we have suffered a loss as well. Um, you know, so it, it was, like I say, was, the, the reaction was one of, of relief. Um, that you know what they experienced was a real injury, a real harm. Um, you know, have we gotten to the point of forgiveness? No, no. I think there's you know there's you have to ask for forgiveness before you can really receive it. That hasn't happened. It's a long process, and it continues to go on and it will for some time. I mean, let's be clear, ladies and gentlemen. You know, we're talking about 500 years of genocide and oppression. One committee cannot wipe that out. And it's going to take, a, you know, but you can start that process. And Sandy Whitehawk was very fond of saying that, you know, the, the, the elders had always said that when this process begins, it begins in the East. And that was the prophecy. And she was always very hopeful about Maine's process. And I think is now can you know, continue to say that as th what you're discussing is now uh, taking firmer root in, in, the, uh, in the cultural mindset, the cultural discourse, very important stuff. 
And Matt, can I have one? Oh, no, Representative Clark, you had a question. Well, I, I'm good. It was it's very similar to what uh, they've asked. So thank you. So, Matt, I'm going to ask you to share one of the things that you mentioned early on, and we experienced this certainly over the last couple of years while working on the apology and listening to testimony from affected groups um, from the eugenics survey. And but when we when we talked in December, you you mentioned I want to talk about the personal weight that you felt as when you took this on, because you, you told me an anecdote about your daughter mm -hmm. seeing the film. Yeah, <clears throat> it was an incredible commitment. You know, one of the reasons, you know, one of the things they asked me in my interview, you know, because I was running for Secretary of State and they said, do you think being Secretary of State offers a conflict? And I said, you know, the Secretary of State of Maine is somewhat different from the Secretary of State in Vermont. You know, yes, we oversee elections, but I oversaw the Bureau of Motor Vehicles, the state archive, the corporate filing offices. And I said, well, I don't think a UCC filing has much impact on child welfare. So I, you know, I don't see a conflict professionally. Um, and also too, as you know, the agency head, that was what was gonna give me the scheduling flexibility to allow myself to do this. I was master of my own calendar as it were, but it, it did take a lot of time. So about my daughter, who's now a junior at the University of Maine, she was, you know, in middle school at the time. This we started this in 2012, so this is now 10 years ago. Um, so the film comes out, and um, it was being shown in, first in, in film festivals, won every Gold Palm Award you can imagine, and then it was on independent lens and it was um, it had over a million and a half viewers across the country. It won an Emmy award. And so finally they have a showing of Dawnland at the University of Maine, right nearby us, right between Old Town and VZ as it were. <laughs> um, and so I take my wife and daughter to go see a screening of the full film, an hour and a half long. And because I was there, you know, I take questions from the audience, much like I'm doing now. And so we're, we're heading home and my daughter says, oh, my God, I had no idea what you were doing. <laughs> and I said, what did you think I was doing for two and a half years? She said, I thought you were doing research. I said, you never, you know, research going away for three or four days at a time. She just, it just here she was living in my house. Uh, Chris, you know, she was a busy teenager, you know, and, and but you, you you extrapolate that out into the community. A lot of people did not know what we were doing or what we were hearing. And, you know, the, as I mentioned, you know, that first, you know, the very first community visit. And I think I told the chair this story and it, it's something I carry with me. Um, we had this, you know, this is long, this is something that happened long before the passage of the Indian Child Welfare Act. And you had this woman, who had been placed in a foster home here in Old Town. Old Town, I always thought was a pretty friendly community. And um, she, she was there with her sister and the, the foster parents didn't like Indians and called them <laughs> dirty little Indians. And uh, if they had an infraction of the house rules, one of the, there are a couple of different punishments, different, different severity. One of the punishments was that you would not be allowed to eat for a day, got no food. So, you know, here's this kid, you know, hungry, runs into the kitchen, steals a banana, takes it upstairs. Well, you know, the foster mother had counted the bananas, of course, you know, and found that one was missing. And she talked about how she heard this woman thundering up the stairs. And in a moment of panic, she takes the peel and shoves it under her sister's mattress. And so the foster mother comes in, what she do? She starts flipping the mattresses finds the peel under the sister's mattress and the sister is locked in the basement for two days with no lights and no blanket. And I thought they're thinking, you know, who does this to small children? These are little kids, like six, seven, eight years old. And, you know, and that was the moment that I realized that there was no way I could absolve myself from any of this. You know, this was done in my name. It was done on my behalf. As a white man, you know, um, regardless of my own intentions, my own history, this was done in my name. 
And um, that's a tough thing to confront. And I think that you have to be prepared for that. One of the things that you know we hear, especially in this very important time that we're in around social justice is you know, between discussions of, of truth and reconciliation, reparations, you know, uh, equality, we have to be careful as a white community um, to not find ways to absolve ourselves. You know, reparations don't make it go away. Um, you know, that's, you cannot erase the past. As Lincoln said, we cannot escape history. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, trying to transform relationships, which is harder to do than to find ways to, to absolve oneself. You absolve oneself, you change the law, you know. You, I mean, if this was easy, the 13th Amendment would have made many of our racial issues go away. But it didn't, did it? You know, we still confront issues of race. Um, and these are things that are learned. Uh, they can be unlearned. We can look at the world in a different way. Uh, but it takes work. And it's hard, hard work. And that's one of the things that I've learned in high relief as a member of the main work on the Peace Child Welfare, Truth and Reconciliation Mission. Um, thank you, Matt. Um, Arnold? Yeah, uh, thank you, Mr. Dunlap, for your, your presentation. I'm wondering what kind of spinoffs have resulted from the work of the Truth and Re Reconciliation Committee in Maine? Uh, well, I mentioned uh, Wabanaki Reach, uh, which is a direct outgrowth of the work of the commission. That was originally the convening group, and they continue to work in the tribal communities to foster uh, talking circles and healing, and that's something that really is in, and, and remember, this is not a matter of tribal communities and non-tribal communities. There are divisions within tribal communities. Uh, there was, there were folks in the tribal communities who are very opposed to the formation of the TRC. It's like, why do you want to dig all this up again? You know, why do you want to rip those scabs off and start the bleeding again? Um, you know, you have people uh, in the tribal communities who are very devoutly religious, who very, very, very sensitive to the exposure of some of the participation in this historic injustices by, for instance, the Catholic Church. Um, but it's there, you know, and, and it's, it's embedded in the culture and, and you learn more and more and more about it, right? So we had the ice storm in 1998, which was as devastating in Maine as it probably was in Vermont. Um, the National Guard was going around to communities with boxes full of blankets. Tribal communities absolutely categorically rejected the blankets because historically that's how we spread smallpox to wipe out Indian people. You know, and that's part of their cultural narrative, which you know we never thought of, right? That was a couple hundred years ago. Um, so that was something that you know we continue to learn about. Um, you know, we had somebody in the commission thought it'd be a good idea to have someone who serve as our commission chaplain. And uh, a woman came from the seminary to kind of sit with us and the, the folks from the tribal communities were horrified, absolutely rejected it because of the participation in, in some of these, especially removing children uh, to the residential schools or the allegations that pedophilia priests could be relocated intentionally to tribal communities to get them out of the way. Um, you know, that was like so far beyond our scope to talk about as a commission, but it's stuff that it filtered in. It was part of the testimony that was brought to us. So in terms of what the, the legacy of the commission is, is that it continues these conversations at sometimes a very intimate local level, not necessarily in terms of dramatic policy change, but as you know, Dramatic policy change often starts with a conversation at the lunch counter. And I think that that's, um, you know, very much uh, what has continued in, you know, what's happening right now, for example, with LD 1626, the tribal sovereignty bill, there's a lot of hand wringing that this, you know, bill may be dead on arrival, you know, that it won't, it won't get through the committee or it'll be amended substantially. And I told 
the folks on the Committee on Indian Relations that 25 years ago, the consideration of this bill would have been absolutely unthinkable. It would never would have gotten out of committee. You know, we wouldn't even be talking about it getting out of committee. But now, you know, the evolution carries forward. And you can see that in a lot of different policy areas, how that evolution takes place. And I think there's a lot of reason to be hopeful. Well, the reason I asked the question is because uh, considering the the extent of time and effort and detail that was placed in the TRC as it relates to Native, Native Maine tribes, uh, I could also see the desire and need for other marginalized and oppressed communities within Maine um, seeking a similar kind of format by which they can address issues of, of, of oppression and the history of, of oppression as it relates to those groups. Do you see that developing? Do you see the initiative that the TRC as it related to native tribes in Maine um, spinning off in, into other groups that, that seek similar kinds of, of, of efforts? I think it's entirely possible. You know, certainly the Acadian people, you know, the, the, the Franco-Americans who were expelled from the St. John Valley, um, who became the Cajuns of Louisiana. Um, you know, we used to hear stories about children being beaten by teachers uh, for getting caught speaking French. You know, there's a lot of opportunity for that sort of thing, but, there, you know, it hasn't like opened a floodgate. You know, there, there, ha there are not moves to have other truth commissions. And I think, honestly, Reverend Thomas, is because it's a very difficult process. It's a difficult process to initiate. It's a difficult process to engage in. And in terms of the concrete results, it's difficult to see. You know, I mean, here we are now, probably five years removed, seven years, actually, seven years removed from the issuance of our report. And, you know, can I point to concrete steps that have been taken? Few, few, but the dynamic conversation has changed. And that's, you know, that's, that's the forerunner for it. So it's, a, it's not like, you know, you, you introduce legislation to reduce the income tax and it finds consensus and you've reduced the income tax and you can say there, we saved everybody X number of dollars per year. Um, it's not quite that product oriented. It's, it's more of a, of a cultural change that takes a long time to shift and, and embrace on both ends, by the way. Yeah. All right. Thank you, everybody. We have to end this conversation right now. This is very, um, thank you. I, I don't even want to put an adjective to it. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Matt, for filling us in. And um, we'll be sure to keep you in our Rolodex um, to age myself there. Um, and we will um, pick this conversation up soon. Before we go off, Steve Ellis is here for the next bill. Steve, do you mind waiting for about 10 minutes? Do you have time? Not a bit. I have put, okay, my, um, I put my email in the chat, um, both my personal and my public email for anybody who wants to reach out to me after this meeting, Mr. Chairman. And Ron, and Ron will have that available. Um, I did share the I did share the main report, and I think it's going to get posted. Uh, but thank you, thank you, Susan. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Arnold. Thank you, Matt. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Committee. And um, I look forward. If you want any folks with lived experience to come before your committee, let me know. I can line them up. Thank you. Thank you. We will. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. Yeah, thank you. All right, committee. Nice.